Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. Tonight we want to look at verse 20. Jesus has introduced the subject of the law. And he has said, don't think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And it is interesting how that Jesus did fulfill the requirements of the law and how Jesus did fulfill the prophecies concerning the Messiah. He didn't come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. And then he said, Verily I tell, and tell you, till heaven and earth shall pass, one jot or one tittle shall not in any wise pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Wheresoever or whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and teach men so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever will do and teach them the same will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus must have made one of the most shocking statements his disciples had ever heard. Bringing up the subject of the law would naturally, in the disciples' mind, bring up the issue of the Pharisees because the Pharisees were professional law keepers. They spent their whole lives just dealing with every little fine technical aspect of the law, endeavoring to keep the law. They were the ones who were constantly challenging Jesus and accusing Jesus of breaking the law. Though it should be noted, Jesus never did break the law of Moses. He fulfilled the law of Moses. He did break some of the ridiculous traditions that they had built up around the law. God's basic law was given on the two tables of stone, the Ten Commandments. The four on the first table of stone dealt with man's relationship with God. To violate those would constitute ungodliness. The second table of the law, the Sixth Commandments, had to do with man's relationship with fellow man. To break one of those constituted unrighteousness. And so Paul said the wrath of God will be revealed against the unrighteousness and the ungodliness of men who hold the truth of God in unrighteousness. So Jesus said that he had come to fulfill the law but now he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Shock waves must have reverberated around the area where the disciples were. What do you mean our righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. As I said, these were professional law keepers. They had not just the Ten Commandments, but they had developed out of that the Mishnah, which was their oral interpretation of the law. And so they sought to determine every fine little point of the law and just what did God mean when he said. And there was all of the oral traditions that had been built up. Jesus did violate their oral traditions as we were discussing last week, though he did not violate the law itself. In fact, he was the only one who actually kept the law completely. Accept your righteousness. 
I guess it's important to determine just what is righteousness. And basically, it just means being right or doing right. Doing the right thing. But if I say righteousness is doing the right thing, then the question arises, what is the right thing and what is the wrong thing? And the philosophers, after spending centuries trying to discover truth, what is right and what is wrong, ultimately despaired of discovery of truth and came to the conclusion that there is no true right or wrong except as it is in a person's own mind. So if it is right for you, then it is right for you. But it is not necessarily right for the person next to you. For everything is relative to your background. Everything is relative to your personality. It's relative to the uh, social mores where uh, you are being raised. And what is acceptable in one culture is uh, rejected by another culture and they will give you all kinds of illustrations in uh, the socio sociology and philosophy books of how uh, the uh, mores vary in the different cultures and what is absolutely taboo in one culture is totally accepted in another culture and therefore right is always relative to the situation and to where you are and, and all of these other things. And they are absolutely certain that there are no absolutes. But I think that we could probably agree here tonight on certain things that are right and certain things that we would all say are wrong. Was it right for those two boys to go into the high school and shoot their classmates and attempt to destroy the school there in Littleton, Colorado? And I think to a person, all of us would agree tonight, that that was not right. That was very wrong. Was it right for that man to deliberately drive his car onto that preschool grounds and kill those two little children? I'm certain that all of us would agree that that was absolutely wrong. There is no justification for that at all. You cannot justify those kinds of actions. It will be interesting to find out what the attorneys or lawyers come up with. Is it right to take something that belongs to someone else? Would it be right for you when your neighbor goes on vacation to break into his home and take his computer and take his TV and uh, take his uh, silver? Would it be right for you to take your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's husband? And I think that we could pretty much agree that no, it isn't right to steal something that belongs to your neighbor, something that belongs to someone else. Now, there would be those that may try to justify this and say, well, maybe that neighbor had been stealing from you 
over a long period of time. And so you were just trying to get back some of the uh, things that, uh, the value of the things that he had stolen from you. And, and we tried to create situations where, well, that might be right under certain conditions, and that's the whole thing of philosophy. To create certain conditions where something that is absolutely wrong might be right. They can create situations where it would appear that telling a lie would be kinder than telling the truth. So that they begin to color things with a shade of gray as they begin to get into the relativism. Is it wrong for someone to deliberately lie to you about an important issue causing you to make a tragic decision? You say, you bet it isn't. Lie to me? No way. Well, then, is it right for you to lie to someone else? Well, that all depends on what the situation is. <laughs> and so it has to be determined what is right. Because how can you be righteous if you don't know what is right? The Bible says that God has informed us what is right and what is wrong. The prophet Micah said, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. David said, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The judgments of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. For a moment, let us just assume that what God has said is right is indeed right. That God has actually given us rules for right and wrong. Rules that are absolute, rules that are universal, you, rules that would apply in any culture, any society. That would mean that you would have to keep God's rules in order to be right or righteous. Conversely, if you would break these rules that God had set, you would be unrighteous. Now, how many laws would you have to break in order to be a lawbreaker? Say there are 10 laws that are laid down. How many of those would you have to break to be a lawbreaker? Just one. And that's exactly what God said. Though you might keep the whole law, yet if you violate in one, you're guilty. Just as guilty as if you had violated all of them. And thus it really doesn't matter which of the laws you broke, you become a lawbreaker or, as the, sin, as the Bible said, a sinner. And the word sin literally means to miss the mark. And the mark is found here at the end of chapter 5, where the Lord said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, 
That's the mark that God has set for us. Is there anyone here tonight that would like to stand up and confess that you are perfect? You have never missed the mark. You've always been right on target. And missing the mark just once makes you a sinner. You're just as much a sinner as the person who has never hit the mark. Now Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. But again, these men were professional law keepers. These men spent their lives seeking to understand the law and seeking to keep every little aspect of the law, condemning those who did not live up to the same standards that they were seeking to live by. It is important that we look then at the righteousness and the, of the scribes and Pharisees to realize how much we have to do in order to exceed their righteousness. Because if you don't exceed their righteousness, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And of course, that's of prime importance to all of us when we come to the end of the road, this life, we want to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But what Jesus has just said seems to close the door of heaven to all of us. And so it is important that we take a look at the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Outwardly, it would appear that these men were very holy, very godly, very righteous men. It showed all over them. Everything they did was di done with uh, the idea of displaying and showing just how righteous they were. But that was just the problem. It was a show of righteousness. It was something that was totally outward. These men observed special times of prayer, faithfully, religiously. These men fasted often. These men were diligent in paying their tithes they even paid the tithes of their mint gardens or their spice gardens, their uh, anise and cumin and their spices. They appeared unto men to be very righteous, and yet Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. When they were so outwardly perfect, what was wrong with their righteousness? Listen to what Jesus said to them. Matthew 23, verse 5. But all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. It was all a show. The whole thing was, and the motive was to be seen of men. It was an outward show. Getting down to verse 23 of Matthew 23, Woe unto you, Jesus said, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, 
for you pay the tithe of your mint and your knives and cumin. But you have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. Now these you ought to have done, but you should not leave the others undone. You blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within you're full of extortion and excess. You blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful on the outside, but within you're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. You see, men were looking at them one way, God was seeing them another way. It is important that we be far more concerned with how God sees us than we are with how man sees us. We may be able to put on a good show for man. We may be able to develop little super spiritual kind of affectations that make us appear very spiritual to men. We can even develop a tone of voice that sounds very holy. And you may even learn how to hold your hands in sort of a devotional way as you talk with people. Hold your head slightly to the side. And say, oh my, that's terrible, isn't it? You know, and, and, and you, can, you can develop this kind of a mannerism that people say, oh, he's so holy. I think he just came from his knees in prayer. And you might even say, well, you know, last night, <laughs> as I was in prayer and God spoke to my heart, you know, and people say, wow. Aren't they something? I wish I could be spiritual like that. The Pharisees had that down. They had a real science out of that. They really appeared holy to men. But God was looking at their hearts. And though they were like whitewashed sepulchers, they were painted white and looked gleaming and all on the outside, Inside there was corrupting flesh, decaying bones. And God was looking at the heart and could see what was in the heart, even as God looks at our hearts and he sees what's in our hearts. And those things that often are highly esteemed by men are an abomination in the sight of God as he looks at the heart. But let's say that we could agree on the rules and we could all say, yes, to do that is right. Oh, to do that would be wrong. And, and we can go down the list and we can agree on the rules. In keeping then all of those rules, would that then make you righteous? Paul said, if righteousness could come by rules, by keeping rules, then Christ died in vain. Even if you could keep all of the rules, outwardly, the Lord is looking at the attitude of your heart. And this is the whole issue as Basically, Jesus is, is starting off this section with a 
with sort of a premise or a, a, a statement. And then he's going to follow up with five illustrations. And the rest of the fifth chapter will be devoted to the five illustrations that have to do with this basic principle that your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees if you desire to enter heaven. And then he will show you the fallacy of the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees in their interpretation of the law and the way they were keeping the law and how God intended the law when he gave it. And basically, all the way through, their righteousness was outward and God's law was intended to deal with the inward attitude of a man's heart. And God is looking always on your heart. The attitude of the heart is more important to God than the actions. So if you could keep all of these rules that we say constitute right and wrong, the righteousness that you would develop would be a self-righteousness. It is something you have done. We've put up the chart. We've put up the gold stars. Your page is solid gold stars. Congratulations. You're the most self-righteous person we've got. <laughs> but that's just the problem. It is a self-righteousness. But there's a big problem with self-righteousness. Because if I am a self-righteous individual, then I am also very prone to be looking around with a critical eye at everybody who isn't living up to the same standard that I'm living. And I know that you have done this, and I know that you broke that. You're not as righteous as I am. I'm more righteous than you. And now you're really in trouble because you're filled with pride and you've messed up. Take off the stars. Now we're dealing with the subject of righteousness that God accepts. The righteousness that he requires to enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, through the prophet Isaiah, God said, we are all as an unclean thing and all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Well, what other kind of righteousness is there if it isn't by keeping the rules? The Bible teaches of an imputed righteousness. Now, imputing is a accounting term. It means that it is put to the account of. The Bible tells us that the angels of God are keeping books on us. And one day we are going to stand before God to be judged and the books will be open and the people will be judged out of the things that are written in those books. The angels are making entries. The Bible says that a man will have to give an account for every idle word. And, and when you start getting into those things, judgment is going to be a terrifying issue. When the thoughts of men's hearts will be judged. That's terrifying. With all of those people standing there and my thoughts are all going to be revealed? Heaven won't be heaven. <laughs> now, the beautiful thing is that when you accept Jesus Christ, 
that whole old record is expunged. The scripture uses the word blotted out, erased. David, after his sin with Bathsheba, prayed, Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Lord, I've done a horrible thing. The records are there. Lord, blot it out. Down in verse 9 of Psalm 51, he said, Hide thy face from my sins and blot out mine iniquities. Through the prophet Isaiah, God said, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. Oh, praise the Lord. God has declared he has blotted out our transgressions. Peter, in addressing the crowd in Acts chapter 3, who had gathered as the result of the healing of that lame man, said unto them, Repent, therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come, from the presence of the Lord. The book that they're keeping on me several pages have been blotted out. And there instead has been imprinted in big bold letters righteous. But not my righteousness. Not righteous because I have kept the laws perfectly. But this is imputed righteousness, or this is an accounting. The angel who was making the account has erased the debits and has written across it righteous. The righteousness that I have tonight exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that has been accounted to me because of my putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Paul, writing to the Romans in chapter 10, beginning with verse 1, said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Today the same is true. You go over to Israel and you'll find that there are these people have a tremendous zeal for God. You can see them at the Western Wall. You can observe them in their prayers. And they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, Paul said. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, are going about to establish their own righteousness, and they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Did you get that? He is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes in him. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, and he said, the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Don't say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word of God is near to you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth 
that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Paul wrote to the Philippians of his own personal experience. In chapter 3 he said, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinks that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. For I was circumcised the eighth day. I'm from the stock of Israel. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And concerning the law, I'm a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I was persecuting the church. And touching the righteousness which is of the law, I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, this great record as a Pharisee, a Jew, a lawkeeper, those things which were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, but do count them but refuse that I might win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness. He gladly chucked over that whole background when he discovered the righteousness of Christ, which is by faith, the righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Paul could have continued as a Pharisee, persecuting the church, trying and doing his best to keep the law and have died and gone to hell. But he realized that there was a righteousness that exceeded that righteousness that he was attempting to gain by the keeping of the law, the righteousness which is of Christ through faith and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. The perfect law of God and keeping it perfectly cannot make you righteous. Paul writing to the Romans again back in chapter 3 said, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, unto all of them that believe, for there is no difference. Therefore we conclude, Paul said, that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And over into chapter 4, For if Abraham were justified by works, he had reason to glory, but not in God. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. God will not accept anything less than the righteousness of his son. That is something you can't earn. That is something that you can't attain achieve but it comes to you as a gift of God when you put your faith and trust in his son Jesus Christ one day they asked Jesus what must we do to do the works of God and he said this is the work of God just believe on him whom he has sent Jesus said to his disciples when the Holy Spirit is come he will testify of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. Of sin because they do not believe in me. 
of righteousness because I ascend to my Father. Now that might seem like a strange pairing. What does the ascension of Jesus have to do with the witness of the Holy Spirit to our hearts concerning righteousness? The ascension of Jesus into heaven was God's witness to man that this is the righteousness that will be accepted into the kingdom of God. He has fulfilled the righteousness. And his ascension is God's witness that having fulfilled the righteousness, he is received into heaven. Our righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, but God has provided for us who are so filled with flaws, for us who could never make it on our own, for us who have a desire but experience the weakness of the flesh, God has provided for us a righteousness that will gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. For the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to your account when you put your faith and your trust in him. God sees my heart. He knows my desire to serve him. He knows my love for him. And he knows that I can't do it myself, but I've put my trust and faith wholly in Jesus Christ. And God accounts that for righteousness. And it gives me entrance into the kingdom of heaven.